two. We've been going through a series for the last couple of weeks through Christmas season on a season to celebrate. And this morning I'm going to preach a message for a few minutes on this topic, a season to rejoice, a season to rejoice. And I believe as Christians, this is really where the key is coming from, for many the, the, the season of Christmas brings with it all kinds of different points of view, you know, and one of the things is some people love it. You know, you get into Hallmark and it's crazy, all TV shows, and there's great, wonderful. Then you get to the end of it and it's like, man, what happened, right? The tea, you, know, you see dead Christmas trees on the side of the road, right? You see broken lights. You see parents fighting as they're trying to restock their storage units and stuff like that, right? You know, you see people going, getting memberships at the gym to make up for Christmas, and using it three times, right? The greatest present ever to give for the real retailer, all right? LA Fitness is gonna make $1,000 next month that no one's ever gonna use. But it's, you know, there's, there's all these pros and cons and then you get done, right? And then January hits and you're excited and you're playing with all of your new stuff and so are the kids. And, uh, and it, you get the bill from the credit card company. And you're thinking, did we take out another mortgage or something? What's going on here? It was just candy, right? It's amazing how it grows. It can change all kinds of ways. But let me tell you, in this season, beyond all of that, there is an exciting reason to rejoice. Because we rejoice because for those of us who know the truth, who understand the truth, this is so much more than just a holiday season as much as it is. It's so much more than just presents and family as much as that's all part of it. So much more than even church and programs and things like that. It is the foundation of much of what we hold to. Therefore, that's the reason we rejoice. Would you follow along as I begin reading in Luke chapter two, verse one. It came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, under the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the end. Father, as we take a few minutes and we look at this passage, or a very familiar passage, we look at it pretty much every year. It's easy for us to get lost into the Christmas aspect of it, easy for us to get lost in the fact that we've heard this so many times. Father, I pray afresh and anew that you would teach us something. I pray we'd be reminded of so much that we can rejoice from this story, for this true account that took place just about 2,000 years ago. I pray, Father, you speak to our hearts. May, you be may we be encouraged. May you be honored. And I pray if there's anyone here still searching for truth, what is the truth? May they find it in Jesus this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to look at three things this morning. We talk about this idea of this Jesus, the season to, to rejoice. We talk about in this cantata we just said, or musical, we talked about the idea of the name of Jesus. Brought that up a couple times. And many of us, if you get in, now we could, you could spend months deciphering all the names of Jesus. I heard a message once, so remember it was uh, preached by Jake Deander and it was entitled Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. That's what it means. Uh, many of you know, if you've heard the term Abba Father, what does that mean? Kind of like daddy, it's the best way to put it. It is a very personal name. So it's what God, Jesus read to God, Abba, and that's what we can say to him. Doesn't that, think about change of perspective. He's not just the big man in the sky who's looking down over us and waiting to strike us down when we've done wrong. You ever felt like that? Usually when we're doing wrong, we feel like that, right? Like, oh, don't look, right? No, he's not. He's not the one. I remember I said this to a Bible class Thursday. Someone made that comment. I said, describe what people think of Jesus. And someone said, waiting to strike us like lightning. And I, you know, how many of you remember the song, Oh, Be Careful, Little Eyes, What You See, For the Father Up Above Is Watching Down in Love, all right? Ken Davis, one of my favorite comedians, he, he's got a version of that song that is seen from the people who have what I consider to be a wrong view of Jesus, all right? He says, oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. For the Father up above will squash you like a bug, right? That's a dark version of that song. I hope they're not teaching that downstairs right now. That's the wrong view. We sometimes have that view. Wait till we mess up. That's not at all what it is. And we have this amazing reason to rejoice because this Jesus is not just a religious character. He's not just a guy in a storybook. He's not just a baby in a manger. He is God. 
But you know more than that? He is our friend. Can you imagine? I mean, just, you know, we that grew up in this, kind of, this, whatever. I won't ask that, raise hand how many agree with that because you have no idea what I'm talking about. You're not paying attention right now, right? For those of us like that, until you really get to see Jesus on that personal nature, it blows your mind. It changes your entire view of everything. Let's look at three things about this season to rejoice. Number one, we see Jesus, the humble Messiah. Jesus, the humble Messiah. In verses number six and seven, it's so, and it was, so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she, being Mary, should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. Jesus, the humble Messiah. Let's look at a couple things about this story here. Number one, the need for deliverer. In this situation, they found themselves in the need for a deliverer. I mean, we, we mentioned this one in the narrations. These people, in their mind, they didn't want a helpless baby. They wanted a conquering king. They wanted to some, someone to come down and, and overthrow Rome immediately. And what is a baby going to do to help in that situation? And they were in great need. They were heavily oppressed and heavily taxed, and not only just under the rule of Rome, but under the rule of Herod, who was kind of given freedom by Rome. And, and then it gets worse because the the religious sect of the day made it worse. They made religion less about a loving Savior and oh, more about just something that can help them. While the religious leaders got more and poor, powerful and more important and, and more wealthy, the people got poor and poor and in greater need. And they were looking just for anyone just for anyone to come. And it had been 400 years since Jesus and God had spoken to them. And so they find themselves in an absolutely horrendous scenario looking for an answer in great, great need. But you see, at this point, they were hoping for a deliverer. While it came, it did not come as many in the day had desired. See, see number two, the humble beginnings of a Messiah. The humble beginnings of a Messiah. God sent his deliverer in the form of his only son, sent to a humble family, born in a stable. Now, you know, you think about it. Who were Mary and Joseph? I'll be honest, today they're glorified a little more than God ever intended them to be. Most of us don't know much about Joseph. We know Joseph was there at the birth. We know Joseph was there when Jesus was 12 years old. We actually have no record biblically of Joseph afterwards. It's very likely that he had passed away. There's a good possibility. That's what we're assuming. There's no other historical record. He really just kind of drops off the map because really you go from 12 years old, Jesus 12, to basically 30, 33 as he begins his journey, he begins his ministry. And you hear of Mary, but you don't, you don't hear of Joseph. But who were, were they? They were a poor family. He was a carpenter. A carpenter wasn't necessarily an overly wealthy person of the day. Uh, well, good with their hands, maybe not even considered a well-educated man. He wasn't a scholar. He was just someone that you go to to buy furniture. And that was the only point. And Jesus is placed in there on purpose in a humble place. He was not going to be wealthy. He would not be well-known. There was nothing in this family that was going to force Jesus to a place of prominence. Not only that, now they take back off because of this taxing to Bethlehem. And when they get there, all the rooms are full. And so they st stay in a stable. There's a lot of debate whether it was a barn, whether it was a cave. All I know is it was outside with horses and a manger. Now, you, you ever been there? I remember growing up and thinking, wow, manger, you know, kind of like a, you know, Old Testament baby crib. That's what I always thought it was. And then I went to a farm once, and they said, someone hand me the manger. And I'm like, we're doing a nativity scene? And I couldn't figure what was going on. What? And then they hand the feeding trough. And I'm like, what? You th it, they cleaned out all the filth. How many of you, when your, aunt, when your pet walks up and licks all over your hands, let's go eat corn on the cob, right? Don't wash your hands. Isn't that great? You know, let, let, no, what do you do when your pet's licked all over you and stuff like that, and you, you pet it? You go clean your hands twice, all right? It's nothing exciting. And so this place, you think about just the stench. How many of you ever been in a barn, like an active barn, not like, you know, drive past ones in Lancaster, all right? Now, I'll be honest with you. If you've driven through Lancaster, you don't have to go into a barn. You just got to turn on the vent. Years ago, we went down to... Uh, the Linux were joke, we were joking about this because they it was bad that one year. We got out there and we're like we we, we want the smog of the city back. We had gotten out and they were just pouring out the stuff. All right, out over the farm, 
All right? And so we get out at the hotel, and we stand there, what is that? I mean, I, convinced. Literally, I, I think Gennady and I were, like, looking at the bottom of our shoes to find if we'd stepped on something. The stench was, and we're like, where are we? You know, and then you see someone else get up. I love that smell. That's not normal. No one loves that smell. You can grow nose dead to it, but you don't love it. And it was bad. So we go into the whole, to go into the conferences and come back out. And the moment you walk out the door, wham, the smell. And I'm like, why didn't we stay on the other side of Lancaster, you know, New York? Why didn't we stay somewhere else? And it, the smell just got worse and worse. And then we're getting ready to go home. And uh, I remember we get, to the, get at the car and Gennady's like, my car smell like this. Right? My car stinks. We get home. We go to pick up my kids. We open the door. My kids jump in. There's something in the car. Do you have an animal or something? What's in the car? And then my kids give me a hug. It's you. And I smelt like the farm. I had to go home and clean things and dry clean things and scrub it. It was horrific. And you know what? We were just across the street from all of it. Can you imagine sitting right next to it? It was not a glorious present sight as we see in nativity scenes. It was an extremely humble beginning. No one would have ever, in our nature, the human nature, would have ever said, when we're going to bring the Messiah down, let's let him hide in the place no one knows exists. You know what? We're going to go tell shepherds, the lowliest of the low. Oh yeah, two years later, some wise men will come, and then we're going to try and kill off Jesus. No one would have thought that. We as humans would have said, let's bring him in as a doll. Let's let him come down from the sky and take over. And to, a, to carpenters, his humble beginnings. And there's no doubt that the people said, this doesn't make any sense. Let me tell you what I believe some principles as you study the New Testament, Luke. And we've gone through this in Luke. You'll notice this. They were so overwhelmed with what they thought they needed that they missed the great promises of the Lord. See, there had been thousands of years of prophecies about this happening. And yet, they were concerned about getting rid of Rome. They had missed the great need and the great promises that Jesus offered. Jesus knew their need was much greater than physical or political. Their need was spiritual. And he came down the way it was promised from thousands of years earlier. Jesus did not come to give himself a position of royalty, but to offer his people's freedom from their spiritual bondage. That's truly what Jesus comes to, to give us. You see, when Adam and Eve sinned, let me rephrase that, when Adam sinned, that's really where it started. It brought pain upon this entire world. And Jesus came down to alleviate that. He didn't come to be a political leader. He will one day. He will come down. It's still in our future. And he will come down to Mark Carmel and split it in half. And he will destroy, just with his words, he will destroy Satan's army. And he will sit and he will give a new heaven, a new earth, and then he will sit rightfully on the throne of his earthly father, David. And ultimately of his kingdom, there'll be no end. That is still coming. That promise is still there. But at this point, he came for the spiritual need of the people. Not only do we see the humble Messiah, but next we see the promised king, Jesus, the promised king. Verses 1 through 5, and it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria, and all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, unto, into Judea, under the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. We see Jesus, the promised king. Let's look at a couple of things. He fulfilled prophecy. Isaiah 9, verse 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Isaiah 7, 14, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. All that took place thousands of years ago is now being seen in Luke chapter 2. It's more than a story. It's a fulfillment of prophecy of people who didn't know Mary and Joseph, who were just told by God what to say. And this was a promise. And interesting, in this promise, he then orchestrated history to fulfill his plan. Think about it. His promise was that in Bethlehem, that was the promise throughout history. When you think about go through history and think about how Jesus 
God used history to fulfill his plan. All right? Let's just go to the book of Ruth. All right? This, this, this father takes the family away. They go into a place that technically they're not supposed to be in. And whatever happens in there, the husband and the sons die. And Miriam gets a daughter-in-law. A daughter-in-law who's not Jewish. And they go home. The daughter-in-law knew going home back to where they're supposed to be. You know, they're not, I'm not going to be accepted. And so she begins to glean from the field. And then this man Boaz comes and meets her. And you know what? Boaz takes and, and marries this young woman. And guess what? This woman, not even from a Jewish line, becomes an ancestor of Jesus. We call it the kinsman redeemer. You could go through history and see how God orchestrates all of it. And by the way, Jesus has one of the dirtiest lineages out there. I mean, we'll just go to the King David, who's supposed to be the greatest. You're right, murderer, adulterer. And through the whole time, God had orchestrated all of it. And so we come down to the time he's supposed to be born, and the woman he goes to is in Nazareth. <laughs> Easy, let's just start a tax. They're used to it, right? And let's go make him go home. So they go back to Bethlehem. All of it orchestrated before the world began. All of it. None of this was a mistake. All of this was orchestrated before Adam and Eve were created. All of this is orchestrated through the Old Testament. And you can see God's righteous plan all the way through to this point to fulfill prophecy. You say, what's the point for me? A neat part of prophecy, what's the point? You see the power of God in his orchestration of this. You can see it in the orchestration of your life. You say, wait a minute. Do you believe God tells control of everything? I believe he's sovereign. I believe he's on the throne. He does give me a free will, though. But you know, and here's the thing that's interesting. You go back to the story of Ruth. Why did the husband leave? A famine. He shouldn't have, but he did. And you could sit back and say, oh, the punishment that came upon. You know what I see when I see the book of Ruth? I see that in spite of that, God's grace was still there. What was the original plan? I don't know. But I know that in spite of man's free will and a bad choice, an amazing thing happened. God can use even my own mistakes for his glory. And if he can orchestrate history, you know what that also means? There's nothing happening in 2018 that surprised him. You're already beginning to see it. 2018 in review, all the stars we lost this year. How many of you have weeped over stars lost this year? All right. I'm not trying to be cruel. All right. But that's what happens. How many of us weeped over money lost this year? All right. Man, how many of you were glad over money gotten this year if you're in the stock market? We could, we could talk about a lot. And there's the re year in review. And you know what happened? You remember in the year in review. Oh, I remember when that happened. I remember when that happened. I remember the tragedy that that happened. And the, the emotions are reminded over and over about what took place in 2018. Some of you got the worst news of your life in 2018. And you're hoping 19 will be better. You know what? God has orchestrated all of that. He's not the least bit surprised by it. And if we allow him, he's got a plan that is so powerful. If he can orchestrate history to this point, it's only been 2,000 years later, he's got so much control. He knows what's going on. And yes, he knew Donald Trump would be president today. He knew six years ago Barack Obama would be president. And he knows who's going to be president in two years. It doesn't make a difference. He's in control. He knows who's going to be president when he comes back. He knows all of this. He is in control. This, it, it, this is important because it gives us a proper view of Christ and religion. He's not just another religious leader. He's the Messiah. He is our deliverer. He is our hope. He is the answer to all of our questions. And the second point is he actually changed the world, literally changed it. You know how many times we say we're going to change the world? I, there are some gadgets out there that have changed the world, all right? How many of you have a smartphone? How many of you realize if you lost your smartphone, you're dead? All right. I'm telling you, uh, when we, I said some we went on vacation and I had a, a smartphone and we, I took my youngest son down to go swimming and I'd taken some reading material and stuff and I was going to lay it on one of the seats and I'd put my phone in the pocket of my swim shorts and, and uh, forgot about it because that's what I do. And um, my son goes, let's go to the lazy river. It is a dangerous river. So we did the lazy river. We get out, we go into the pool, and I walk through, and there's a really warm part of water around me, and I was getting nervous, to be honest with you. <laughs> then I realized it was me, and I was getting more nervous, to be honest with you, because I had no idea why, and then I felt down in my pocket was hot, 
And I pulled my phone out. You know what I heard? Snap, crackle, pop. I'm not kidding. It was making noises, and it weren't good noises. And tears began to cut. I was already wet, so nobody noticed the tears. What? And this was like Monday. I had to go till Saturday without a smartphone. My wife was smiling. Praise Jesus. Thank you. Right? So rude. So we get back. I order the same one. I, I, we get back. We're coaching soccer this year. We play South Rock Christian School. We've not beat South Rock in over 10 years. Sham Linick was on the last team. And we, won. and we come from behind two to nothing to win. And it was cold out there. And you know what the guys decided to do? They want to show me how much they appreciate it by dumping water on me. Where's appreciation in that? I never got that one. I mean, good thing it's not soda. That would be weird, right? But, but you know what? I thought my pot, my, that new phone was in my pocket here. So I turn. It was in my back pocket. <laughs> I pull it out, and there's a little green Android laughing at me. Seriously, it had gone blank, and the green Android was there. And I'm like, I need to get an iPhone. I was serious. You've got to be kidding me. I have the third version of that phone. It's still working. It's only been about a month, but it's still working. You look at how things have changed the world and how I, I couldn't live without this. By the way, most of us remember we did. You remember men when we had to stop and get directions? We didn't want to, but we had to. The younger men, what are you talking about? I just asked Siri. The older men, no, no, my wife told me to if I wanted to sleep in the room. That Right? You know, that's, we're stuck. I know where I'm going. I've seen that tree five times. It's changed our life. Can I tell you, Jesus literally changed the world. I mean, let me just give you some simple thoughts. His birth is the dividing point of our calendar for years. A.D. to B.C. They're changing that now, but that, that's what it was before Christ in the year of our Lord. All of history has been focused around Jesus. Even some of the greatest hatred in our world has been focused around Jesus. All of history has been focused around this one person. By the way, everybody will disagree with that that doesn't like Jesus. All right? But those who know true history know. They might even not like Jesus, but their Christianity has been one of the focal points of history. It is one of the foundational principles our country was built upon. I don't care what anybody else says. Just read the documents. Jesus literally changed the world. We see the humble Messiah and the promise, prophesied king. Let's look at number three. We see Jesus, the loving Savior. Verse number seven. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. It's interesting, the term swaddling clothes is preparation for his death. Swaddling clothes is rags. It's what they'd wrap people in for, their, for death. At his birth, in zero, if you want to say, can you call it 1 AD, 0 AD? What would you even call it? There? Zero. All right. At his birth, he was preparing for his death. You see, Jesus didn't come to bring a holiday. In all reality, we're pretty confident Jesus wasn't born in December at all. Likely closer to June, everybody's going to have a different point of view on that. Depends on which commentator you read. But he wasn't born in December. We won't even worry about all the other details. Does it make a difference? He didn't come down to be royalty. He didn't come down uh, to be accepted. He didn't come down. He came down. The Bible says he came to seek and to save them which are lost. He came to give us life more abundantly. He came at this point to spend 30 years as a child in training, and then for the next three years would travel this earth as a prophet, the world saw, to finally realize this was a king of kings, to ultimately hang upon the cross. Why? For your sin and for my sin. He came to be a loving Savior his entire life. Think about it. Every time he, often he would come to Rome and he'd see people punished. And he'd see the crucifixions and he'd see the cat and nine tails. That was all seen through his life. And you know what? He knew one day he'd have to go through that. At 12 years old. I couldn't even tie my shoes at 12 years old. At 12 years old, he's teaching people in the temple. And yet he had to wait that much more time. And then he spends time, he, he came down as, as, as perfect, down to live in the human limitations of the human body. That has got to be the biggest part of itself. Now granted, he didn't, you know, I'm 42, he never got that old on this earth. But I'm telling you, having played sports throughout high school and now being 42, sports catch up with you. I played soccer most of my time, so I, my ankles stink, they're just mush. And so when I get up in the morning, I got to be very careful, because if I try to take a step without preparing for it, I go on my face. The ankles aren't ready. And so I walk weird. And my wife just laughs at me because my ankles are sore. Why? Because I'm 42. I'm getting older. Some of you are saying, that's really young. I know. 
I know. I'm sorry for you. No, I'm saying <laughs> you're in more pain than me. Let's put it that way. Someone the other day caught me and said, don't get old. It's okay. I'm just going to look old. I'll never get old, okay? Jesus came to one day hang upon that cross. Philippians 2, 6, and 7, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal to God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon the form, him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Three things that happens and he comes and he desires to, for you to be in his family. Three things. Number one, he calls us. The Bible says a man cannot be saved except the Father call him. We call it conviction, but let me explain what it means. It may be happening at this point. Your, your, your eyes are open and you realize that this is more than just church. This is more than just a musical. This is more than just religion. There's real reality here. All right? We laugh, we joke, we have a good time because we don't have religion here. We're some of the most unreligious people here because we don't believe in man-made tradition. We have God. We have Jesus. We enjoy his grace and his mercy. And so we come and we enjoy that because he's called us and there's part of you now that knows I need, I don't know all what it is. I don't understand all of it, but I know there's something here I need. That is called the, God's conviction. He is calling you right now and saying this is for you. But then number two, he changes us. Some say, well, when I get better, I'll come to God. No, 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 no. Come to God. Let him deal with the details. Come to God as you are. He said, well, I got to be good. Can I tell you? God said, I didn't come to bring the righteous to repentance, but sinners. If you're that good, God doesn't want anything to do with you. I must acknowledge I'm a sinner, and I must see my need of God, and then I can have salvation. Then he changes me. On his own, in his own time. You know, there are people who have been saved. How many of you have been saved since you were five years old or younger? Or I, right? very few. How about 10 years old and younger? All right? you, you know what I'm talking about. It's been part of our life. We don't think a whole lot about it. We grew up this way. How many of you have been saved less than 10 years? Okay. You know what I'm talking about when it talks about God changing you. It's nothing like all, you don't just wake up one day. Ooh, but you do begin to see things differently because the Holy Spirit develops you. That's the change. It's him working in you. And then he promises us. What does he promise? A home in heaven. Hope in our lives today and help during time of struggles. By the way, he doesn't eliminate problems. There's been this idea that once you're saved and you get Jesus, your problems disappear. I really wish they would, but they don't. I don't lose the battles. I, mean, I don't lose the problems. The battles don't disappear. They come. I just have someone to go through it with me. Aren't you glad you have someone to go through it with you? Years ago, I was, uh, I was living back on the uh, parsonage, and I got a phone call, and I kept ignoring it. I didn't recognize the number, and I, it's my, I don't have a home phone, so it's a telemarketer. I kept ignoring it, and finally, the fourth time, I, I picked it up, like, what? And it's so and so, this is from the, the police department. <laughs> I didn't do it. That was the first time. I didn't do it. And they're like, no, sir, we need you up at the church. I'm like, what do you mean, we? There are f uh, five officers up at the church waiting for you. Come on, I didn't do it. I really didn't do it. No, somebody left the doors unlocked and all the windows are open. They, they just need you to come lock it up. Oh, this is 2.30 in the morning. So I come walking up and I walk in. There were five officers, three men and two dogs. And I looked up to one dog. Oh, he's cute. The cop goes, get him. And he jumped and I backed up. He goes, I just had to do that to see your reaction. And they're just sitting there calm. And I was like, is there a problem, sir? And the one officer goes, no, 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 no. We were just going to clear the building. And then we went to your basement. It makes noises down there. We're convinced there's demon possession, so we brought the dogs in because we're not going down there. So they brought the dogs in just, if you've ever been in this basement at nighttime, I'm telling you, the building talks to you. Go home, right? It's just weird. Weird noises. And they're like, oh, and they were laughing, having a good time. And they're right. There's been times at night I walk through here and weird, you know, weird noises. You don't believe me? I'll meet you here tonight at 11 o'clock and I'll let you walk the basement. All right? And then I'll take you to the hospital, okay? As you're having a heart. It's freaky. Let me tell you, I'm glad when I go through when I when I go through places like that, I know where I'm going. I got a flashlight or someone to guide me. In life, there's gonna be all kinds of things that we have no idea what's coming. But with Jesus, I have a guide who knows and who can guide me through it. And he gives promises. If you're here today, here's what I want to offer to you. If you're not sure you're saved, we'd love an opportunity to share the word of God with you. What I mean by that is, you, I'm not talking about membership, baptism, those are later. 
I'm saying I'd love from the Bible to share what God says about heaven. And everybody's got different opinions. You're not going to get our opinion. You're not going to get our doctrine. You're not going to get the church's beliefs. You're going to get the Bible. And we'd love a chance to share what the Bible says about heaven. If you don't want to do anything with it, you don't have to. Come get the information and then go home. But we'd love an opportunity to be able to take God's living word and show you how it can completely change your life. And may this Christmas season be the season where you call upon Jesus and your new life begins. Father, we love you. We thank you for the privilege we have to worship you this morning. Father, we come before you asking you to do a great work in our heart. We're grateful for the name of Jesus, Lord, the great power.